This morning we want to uh, think about Psalm 73. That's the Psalm of Isaac. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek, they are not in trouble as others are, and they are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace, violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness, uh, their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak malice, loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people uh, turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly in, ter in terrors, like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord. When you arouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. <coughs> Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I might tell of all your works. Now, we all know about King David's great sins. Murder, adultery, deceit, lies, all the rest of it. How would you compare David's sins with the sin of Asaph, who wrote Psalm 73? And his sin was... <coughs> In verse 2, but as for me, I, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now both David and Isa found forgiveness uh, and they found a new perspective on their lives, on what really matters in this world. And so uh, Asaph wrote Psalm 73 and David Psalm 51. And both of these Psalms speak of the ugliness of the sin and also the wonder of the restoring grace of God. Now who was Asaph? He was a godly man. And he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. And we've got 11 of his psalms in our Bibles. And Isaac and his whole family were also very gifted musicians. 
And King David appointed them as the musicians in the temple. We read that in 1 Chronicles 16. Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Isaiah and his brothers. And again in the same chapter, we read, So David left Isaac and his brothers there before the ark of the covenant of the Lord to minister regularly before the ark as each day required. So that means of all the people of Israel, perhaps except the high priests of these people, Isaac and his crew were in the immediate presence of God. Every day he took his place next to the ark of the Lord. And we know that the ark was the most precious, holy piece of furniture in the hall of the temple. The ark was the throne of God. And it is in this environment that Isaac sang his songs of thanksgiving and praise to God and at the same time he rebelled against the Lord in his heart and he committed the sin which he confessed here I was envious of, of the arrogant I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now let's look at this psalm as a whole, Isaac's sin and how we, he was restored uh, to full communion with God in a most wonderful way. And then let us look at this fatal, how fatal and how destructive this sin is, this sin of envy is in, uh, for us as Christians and for our ministry in, our, in the church and how we can be restored to true contentment and to find new joy and uh, security in Christ. Now, the psalm is uh, a prayer to God. It is really his personal testimony before God and before people. It seems to uh, go in three lots. One, he, he speaks of they, the people he envied. Then he looked up to God, what God is like, how God looks at these people, and what he's going to do. And then he speaks of I, and he sees himself in, uh, in the nearness of God in a whole new way, finding new delight and joy in God. Now, he speaks about them, they, and he gives us a very detailed uh, profile about these people. As you read in verse 4, they have no pangs until death, their bodies are sleek and fat and sleek. They're not in trouble as other people are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covered them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak malice loftily. They threaten oppression and they set their mouth against the heavens and they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the most high? So he's, he's not ignorant. Asaph could not plead ignorance. He observed their character. He observed their lifestyle very closely as he tells us that exactly what these people are like and yet he envied them. They were the rich and famous and the arrogant, proud, violent people and Isaac envied that they are never sick. And they have no problems like other people have. 
They're the godless people who even dare to challenge God. God is irrelevant. We can do what we like. Is there knowledge in the Most High God? How can God know? So Isaac knew exactly what these people were like, and yet he envied them because they had the money. And Isaac overlooked their character and how God would see them. He envied them. He compared his own material situation or his own health problems, whatever he had, with the prosperity and the health of these uh, ungodly people. And he concludes in verse 12, Behold, these are the wicked, all that there is, and they increase in riches. See what's happening. He was Isaac in the temple, and more and more he lived a double life. There was this growing contradiction in his heart. For even while Isaac was in the most holy place on earth, doing the most sacred things there are to be done in this world, and he, he was in the presence of God, and yet his heart was way outside the temple far away from God and he compared his poor situation and his poverty with their, with their prosperity of the wicked and he said I wish I have uh, what they have this continued until verse 17 is the turning point in this story until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I perceived their end. And that was the wisest decision he ever took in his life, that he, he, he stopped looking at people and he stopped looking at God, how God sees that and he perceived their end. He sees the whole thing in a better, better perspective. And then he felt ashamed of what he has done. He said, oh, I was such an idiot. How could I ever be such an animal? An animal, he says, always looking down into the dirt and finding something to eat, never looking up to where Christ is, seated at God's right hand. And he says, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a, a beast toward you. And he lost it all. But now he learned in the sanctuary of God to look up to God because the ultimate reality in this world is God. And he learned here that the Lord is not a passive spectator to what is going on in this world. And he just doesn't look at these people and doesn't know anything what to do with these ungodly people. He knows them, what is going on, and he's going to keep these, hold these people to account. The arrogant and the proud and all the ungodly will have their day in court. What Paul speaks of, the day of wrath, uh, Romans. So he speaks of truly, verse 18, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. You see, they're not straight away cast into hell because God is merciful. God is compassionate. God is patient with these people, giving them time for repentance. But if there's no repentance, then judgment will come. And here you have an indication of the reality and the eternity of hell itself. And there, Isaac confessed his sin. How could I ever fall so low? I was such an idiot. My feet almost slipped. I stumbled. If the Lord had not pulled me back the last second, I would have shared the condemnation 
with all these ungodly people. But in the sanctuary, his life was turned around. And instead of envy, Asaph experienced God. And then he never wanted to leave the sense of God, this nearness of God, ever again. He would never lose it again. And he says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom am I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I, desire, that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And there Isaac experienced an intimate relationship with God himself and the nearness of God in his heart and in his life. And Asaph discovered something that we know of in the New Testament Christians. Peter, the Apostle Peter writes to Christians who were even persecuted. He says, even though you don't see him now, you love him and you rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. And the glory of heaven and the joy of heaven, as it were, overflows into their hearts right now. And then Asaph, his place next to the ark of the, God, of, of the Lord, and singing the songs became the most wonderful place on earth that he could imagine. And he sang his songs of praise with new joy and a new conviction. Interestingly, you, you, might, ex you might not have expected uh, this kind of uh, joy in the Old Testament. Uh, some people speak of the Old Testament as only law and sin and genocide and all sorts of wars, and they would not expect uh, such grace and joy in the Old Testament if he talked like this, uh, that's very wrong. This experience of God himself then was the end of all envy and jealousy and discontentment and unhappiness. And with this new experience of being new, near God, he found satisfaction and fulfillment both for his life and for the resurrection, life after death, where the nearness of God that we have now will become even more glorious. As he says it in verse 24 and afterward, you will receive me to glory. What a wonderful promise that is when we think about Google Ferguson. And we might go to the service on Tuesday. This promise is being fulfilled in its experience. Because God says so. You will receive me to glory. That is our hope and our expectation and our certainty. Now, this is the antidote. This is the answer to envy and jealousy and all these things. From then on, Isaac had no desire. He had no need to look at everybody else, what they have and what I haven't got. He would tell these people, I have much, much more than they have. I have the fullness. And as Christians in the New Testament, we know how true this is, that in Christ, we have everything. We have much more. And this was the message of Paul to the Corinthians that we read before. The Corinthians were 
envies and jealousy and, and competition with one another. And the one said, I, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. And they were divided amongst each other about the things. And Paul says, you foolish people. Don't you realize that in Christ you have the fullness. That's foolish to envy one another on little toys that we might have. In Christ we have it all. And so he writes in 1 Corinthians 3, The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. So there's no point of having envious about the toys that other people have and I haven't got when in Christ we have it all. And this became the message of Isaph, his personal testimony before God and before people when he concludes his psalm, for behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I might tell of all your works. Now, at this stage we might do well to become a little bit more personal about this and to see the seriousness and the absolute destructiveness of this sin of envious in our Christian lives. What it, how it destroys our lives how it destroys our ministries and our work in the church, which is the temple of God, where Christ is. First of all, we need to realize that envy is an evil and a mortal sin for Christians, as it is for everybody else too. And it is a sin which we easily excuse and apologize for and we tolerate it easily. Because we are, it comes so easily, everybody does it, so what's wrong with it really? It's not really a bad sin at all. And people have it when they're toddlers. You know, when I visit uh, the grandchildren, one family with three little ones, I have, and I want to give a present to one, I have to make sure that I give a present to all three uh, of equal value, otherwise there is envy, and I've got quarreling, and no one enjoys their gift, they enjoy, and they're envious of everybody else. And envy keeps busy, it keeps people busy all day long. Envy uh, moves the economy, the, in the, the advertising uh, industry, where they say, look at this, doesn't it make you envy? It's only that much. If you ring in straight away, uh, you get the second one free or cheap or half price or whatever. You ring immediately, you've got to have it. And doesn't make it, doesn't make that envious. And so the preacher in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 4 says, I saw that all toil and all skill work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. And scripture warns us in many, many places uh, to avoid and to fear this evil sin of envy. And Asaph should have read his Bible and taken it seriously, which he had. I have a few passages here in Proverbs. Uh, just to read them out. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. And again, let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the way. And again, do not en be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. 
And again, fret not yourselves because of evildoers, and be not envious of the wicked. And in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus himself warns us of this envy. He speaks of a lot, of a long list of vices that come out of the heart, and envy is together with uh, evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery. Um, so all this one is in very bad company. The Lord Jesus was condemned to death by the Pharisees and by the elders and by all the leaders of Israel. Why? Even Pilate could understand it was out of envy that they accused him. The Apostle Paul also gives us a long list of vices, uh, the works of the flesh, and he places envy together with such things as sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, drunkenness, orgies. So envy is certainly not a casual sin which we could easily tolerate and uh, excuse. And then we have Paul's letter to, the, to Timothy. And that almost reads like a commentary to Psalm 73. He says, 1, 1 Timothy uh, 6, Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be, to, to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all uh, kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many uh, pangs. So this almost reads like a commentary to Psalm 73. And Psalm 73 itself, Asa's confession of sin ought to be a warning for us to take this uh, sin very seriously. Uh, envy is like the blood disorder that I have. It, it is invisible and it kills you slowly. You know, at the time when I was diagnosed with this, uh, just on two years ago now, uh, the doctor said, you may have had this problem for four, three or four years already. Now, at that time, I walked the Biblion track from Denmark to Albany and other places. And looking back, I could see some symptoms that things were not quite all right. But I never took it seriously let alone see it as something sinister and evil as cancer. And the sin of envy is like that. And we need to take it seriously. Now, let me become a little more personal still. You know, as Christians, this goes a lot deeper than that. Because as Christians, we are working and members in the church, and that is uh, the temple of God. That is where the Holy Spirit works, where his word is preached. And envy will destroy our faith in God. And envy makes us doubt the goodness of God, the graciousness of his providence for us. His goodness, His knowledge, His presence in our lives. And then the, we fall as deeply as Isaac did, as he says it in verse 13. Envy was his apostasy. That was really falling as deeply as you could possibly fall when he said these tragic words, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Now once a believer 
thinks that way or says it, he or she hits rock bottom. It could not get any worse. You know, when I considered the psalm, I thought he must have thought of me and was just written for me. And in fact, this is a, a psalm for every pastor, for every teacher of the gospel of Christ. It is a final warning. If this kind of envy is not checked, leaves unchecked and untreated, it invariably leads to a burnout and to spiritual bankruptcy. Well, the man is up front, yes, but he's an empty shell. I've been there, done it, confess it. I'm not proud of it. There you are in your office, comparing commentaries, preparing a sermon for the people of God, but in your heart, you're far from God. And there is this growing dissatisfaction. Why can't I have a job like everybody else? You compare yourself with the ungodly and even with the arrogant. And envy begins to control your heart, what you've got and what other people apparently have. And you say to yourself, in absolute discouragement, all in vain, have I kept my heart clean. And more and more it happens that the scriptures, the holy things of God, the sacraments, your whole ministry in the church, becomes a burden. You lose your joy in the Lord. And it's not the workload. And it's not the people. It is the envy in your heart. Dissatisfaction with God himself. And this is the envy in your heart which will inevitably lead to a tragic burnout situation and spiritual bankruptcy. Your heart is empty, just an empty shell. Now let me become a little bit more personal still. You yourself might have felt that way at times. You continue to discipline yourself, to live the Christian life and to do it right. You come early to church, set, set up the table, uh, the, the chairs, do everything right, see that the coffee in the kitchen and everything else is in uh, prepared for the service of God but it more and more becomes a routine what you might have done already five years ago things changed there is no joy in it there is no heartfelt anticipation of God being here and God is going to bless his people it's no more a ministry of praise and thanksgiving to God. And then one day you, you find yourself thinking and perhaps saying it. We're not getting anywhere in this church, are we? Now what's happening here when we go that way? Is this the language of repentance and faith as perhaps it should be? Or is this the language of envy? What do we mean by saying getting nowhere? And we say, well, other churches are just more successful. Successful in what? Well, in numbers, in money, in the public recognition of being a growing, prospering church, which you are not and other people are. And so you we compare our personal situation with that of other people and our church situation with that of other, other churches. And we ask, is it really all worth it? What is it really that we want to, quote, get? Let us learn from Isaac. 
Verse 2. My feet almost stumbled. My feet nearly slipped. And you ask, why? Why did he stumble? For I, I was envious. So even as he stood near the ark of the Lord, in the most holy place there is on earth, he said these dreadful words all in vain. Now this is hitting rock bottom. We cannot fall any deeper and further away from God than being busy in the service of God and worship of God and singing praise and thanksgiving and handling the Lord's Supper and it say all in vain. Isaac almost lost it all. Why that? Because he looked at his own great efforts and what he did every day and how he sang his songs and how he kept his heart clean and all these good things. And as he looked at himself, he experienced the spiritual emptiness, this bankruptcy, this lack of joy. And his job that the king asked him to do in the temple, singing songs of praise every day, seemed monotonous. And then he said it loudly, I'm getting out of this job. It's not getting me anywhere, is it? All in vain. I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. Do you know what? I think it is time for all of us to again enter the sanctuary of God as Isaac did. The Lord Jesus Christ is the temple. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sanctuary. And in Christ we will find forgiveness and fullness for our emptiness. And our feeling bored, our feeling frustration. Frustration about the holy things of God. In Christ we will find renewal of our mind. To get our thinking straight, to really think as to what really matters in this world and what where we're getting at, where we're traveling to. And then we might see the other way around, how privileged I am to be a member of the church, how privileged I am to be a worker in the church of God. Christ is the answer to our emptiness, our bankruptcy, and there is something else which isn't in words. That all too long with our envy, we have been grieving the Holy Spirit of God, and that is serious. The Holy Spirit of God, who is a seal for our redemption. So our deliverance from envy, the renewal of our mind, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Isaac discovered it, he says, before this, before he entered the sanctuary of God, he says, when I thought to understand it, it seemed to me a wearisome task. He just couldn't get his head around understanding it all anymore. It's a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God then I discerned their end. So, let us never again think or sigh all in vain. Why not? Because it is a lie. It is a lie from the devil and it comes right out of hell when we say that. And then be discouraged in our work for the Lord. Remember, 
how the Apostle Paul encourages Christians in Corinth. Now, Corinth was a congregation uh, that had more problems and more discouragements than perhaps any other of the New Testament churches, but it did not discourage the Apostle Paul, and he did not want these Christians in Corinth to become discouraged in it all, and he doesn't want us to be discouraged. And he finishes, he concludes uh, his letter here with these words, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. Amen.